What's good, people? Agent Juice reporting for duty. By the time you see this video, I will be in the twilight days of my 20s. Because the next video you see, uh, next week's upload, basically, I will be 30 years old. Now, the thing about turning 30 is I've now had more than a decade of adulthood under my belt. So not only have I seen 30 years of life, I've now seen 12 years of adult life where I don't have the full protection and dependency upon my parents. And so I've seen this 30 lessons at 30 shtick done before on YouTube. So I decided, hey, I'll, I'll throw my own uh, 30 cents in. So here are my 30 lessons I have learned at age 30. Hey guys, Agent Juice again. I uh, am actually doing an edit, a kind of a last minute edit to this video. The main reason why is because I actually made this video quite a while ago. And because of the uh, new development of our uh, unfortunate pandemic, I decided to update the, uh, the first two lessons of this video in order to be a little more timely to the situation. So if you're wondering why I look different for the first two uh, <laughs> lessons as opposed to the rest of the video, that's why. So without further ado, here is my 30 lessons I have learned at age 30. Lesson one, the world does not owe you anything. We are going through the worst pandemic the world has ever seen in the modern era. The spring of 2020 is showing a unique problem to humanity and is kind of nature's way of saying, do not trifle with me. Despite all of your advancements, despite all of your successes in making life easier, you are still just a creature and you all bleed and die the same. And that's very sobering, if you think about it. When I first recorded this lesson, the thing I wanted to say is that we have the privilege of living in the best time in human history, despite what you have seen on the news. The fact that we have had more medical advancement, the fact that we've had more social justice advancement than any other point is nothing short of a miracle. However, we are now facing one of our great crises of this species. And I have confidence that we can make it through it, specifically because we are at a point where we are better off than we've ever been. Now, obviously, we're not better off than we were at the beginning of the year, but you get my point. Think about this. The fact that we even can create this miracle technology known as a vaccine is wonderful. You know, we have these great minds and all of these doctors and healthcare workers who are out there going through their own world war, basically, you know, trying to save as many lives as possible is at the very least made easier, and I'm using this word tepidly because I know they're not having an easy time at all, but at the very least, at least they have modern technology on their side. Imagine if we had to face this with the technology of the 1900s. Imagine the death toll. Now, obviously, we wouldn't also have the amount of global travel we have today because of technology, and unfortunately, that's the new truth of the world these pandemics that we're facing are going to be the new normal. However, because we also have the technology to stop it and the technology to hopefully learn from our mistakes, we can get past this, learn our lesson, and have better preventative measures. The unfortunate truth is that the real world, okay, is nature, wilderness. You could go out and, and look at any documentary or Discovery Channel, what's it about wildlife, and that is the real world. For billions of years, living in the real world meant you had to be brutal and tough and be willing to kill in order to survive. And our comfy lifestyles that we get to live today, even in the global pandemic, with some of us being able to be in a sheltered area with running water and a little bit of food if you stocked up, but, but the fact that you could even have the idea of going out and purchasing food as opposed to going out and hunting it is beautiful. So if anything, this pandemic has taught us that 
we should not take what we have so lightly because it can be taken away so quickly. And unfortunately, that is the law of the land. And anything less than absolute brutal survival is a privilege. Lesson number two, pay it forward. Just because we live in a cruel, unforgiving world doesn't give us the excuse to be assholes to each other. Because we live in a situation where we have our needs provided for us, and even despite the troubles that we are facing right now, there is a, a sort of a moral obligation we have to use our privilege, our, our situation that is better than those situations around us, and lend a helping hand. Be there to help people. And one of the heartening things in our current pandemic situation that we are seeing is people who are willing to help, you know, especially going, you know, to all the healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses and whatnot, going out there and being on these, these horrible front lines that they have to be on. That is admirable. That is paying it forward. And we should not live in a world where we look back upon our past and say, I suffered, so why shouldn't they suffer? That is not a good way to live. We should instead say, I suffered. I shall make sure that they will not suffer in the future the way I did in the past. Lesson number three. The man who says, I am the king, is no king. This is basically actions speak louder than words. I have seen a lot of people posturing where they'll say like, I'm this, I'm that, I, I, me, me, look at me talk, look at me talk and show none of it. Think of it this way. If you are the tallest person in the room, you don't have to say I'm the tallest person in the room. You just have to stand up and that's all the proof you need. So the people who truly are what they claim to be never have to claim it. They just do, do or do not. There is no try. There is no yakking about it, do or do not. Lesson number four, everyone needs some degree of religion. Now, this does not mean theological religion because there is such thing as ideological religion as well. And there are some people like uh, theological religious zealots. There are ideological religious zealots. I have found that people need a god to worship and a witch to burn. What that looks like depends on the person. For some people, it's very simple. God is good. Satan is evil. For some people, it's my side is good and the other side is evil. And unfortunately, when you get into that dogma, you regress and go against progress, which is a shame. But I believe that having that kind of God to worship and witch to burn dichotomy is important and no one can escape it. So I have made it my mission to make sure that the God I worship and the witch I burn are as logical and forward thinking as possible. So I have decided that my God is going to be welcomeness, open-mindedness, conscientiousness, wisdom, and my witch to burn is going to be ignorance, close-mindedness, hypocrisy, that kind of stuff. So what I'm saying is don't think you're above religion. You're not. Uh, that would make you not human. Just Choose your religion wisely. Lesson number five. Defeat is a greater judge of character than victory. My mama has a phrase that she always says, which is, hard times do not make character, or build character, I should say. Hard times reveal character. You will see people for who they truly are when they are told no. You will see the mask fall off. You will see them reveal their true colors. So... Look at yourself and think of the times where you were defeated, when you were at your lowest, when you were at your angriest, when you were, I don't know, playing a video game and you got super frustrated and you threw the controller and you threw a fit. I've done that plenty of times. I've done it with things more meaningful than video games. And it taught me a lot about myself. And it's something that I am looking to really figure out who I am. When I lose, because I will lose in life, what am I going to do? Because that will be the true judge of my character. And what is your character when you lose? 
Lesson number six, self-sufficiency exponentially improves altruism. This is kind of going into the whole pay it forward thing. Um, it's the concept of sweep your own doorstep before you worry about your neighbor's dirty doorstep, where you are going to be in a better position to help people once your own life is in order. I've seen a lot of people who are good, good people, who are either physical or emotional wrecks, who burn themselves out trying to help everyone around them, and yet their own lives are in some kind of jeopardy. And this is not to badmouth them. It's just to say that there's a reason why they burn out, is because there's a lot going on with themselves that it, it, se it seems like it's a big thing to project uh, helping others as a means of avoiding helping yourself. I think there's actually a psychological phenomenon about that, and I've seen it a lot. And so I have decided that I do want to help, but I also want to make sure that my own affairs are in order so that I can exponentially improve my ability to help others. It's like this. Say what you will, but if you have a million dollars versus only $10,000, you can do a lot more with a million dollars, a lot more helpful things than you can with $10,000. That's just mathematics. Lesson number seven. Evil may be subjective, but everyone knows it when they see it. My definition of evil is a lesser desire being prioritized over a greater need. A very simple example would be, um, I want ice cream, a lesser desire. I am willing to run over an old lady, the greater need of her life, to obtain my lesser desire of ice cream. That is objective evil. I've committed a horrible act. Now, if I was in a horrible situation where uh, a bomb in the center of the earth is going to blow up unless you murder this old lady and then you will save the world. Well, you know, I'm a murderer now, but I also saved the world. So is that evil? I don't think so. It's horrible, but it's not my definition of evil. So basically people have all kinds of different uh, examples of what they think is good or evil, but I, I believe that everyone's basis of evil is an agreed upon idea that if someone's lesser desire trumps uh, a greater need, then that act ends up being an evil act. Lesson number eight, people don't need a reason to hate you. Hate, I believe, is comfort. That's why reality TV is a booming business. You get to see people go crazy. You get to gossip about how, how stupid they are and, and how you don't like them because of their hair or because of the way they talk. It's, uh, it's an ability to point your finger at someone and say, at least I'm not that person. Wow, what a mess. Look how I can compare myself to that person and make myself feel better. And no matter who you are, you could be Mahatma Gandhi, you could be Mother Teresa, you could be Fred Rogers, and someone out there is going to hate you. And it's going to be up to you to decide whether or not you care. Maybe it's someone you like. Maybe it's like a maybe it's like I don't know your childhood hero who ends up hating you, and that, and that kind of hurts. But it's an unfortunate truth that we're all going to have to face. And hopefully, you can internalize the uh, idea that those who mind don't matter, and those who don't who those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Lesson number nine: unconditional love is rare, so cherish it. There are very few people in your life, if any, who are willing to love you no matter what you do. Chances are, if there is unconditional love in your life, it's probably from your parents, or at the very least, your mother. Uh, no matter what horrible act you commit, she will still love you. But understand this, not even a mother's love can be truly unconditional in some cases. There are some of you out there who probably have never felt nor ever will feel unconditional love. And if you have unconditional love, do not abuse it, because that is exceptionally rare and something that will disappear in your life one day. Lesson number 10. All other relationships are conditional, and that is fine. So piggybacking off of the idea of unconditional love, all other relationships and all other loves are very conditional. Think about it this way. Uh, you marry the love of your life, and you say, oh, I love them unconditionally. Eh, no, no, that's not true. What if they start being mean to you? What if they start abusing you? What if they start, what if they commit a horrible crime? You know, are, are you going to love them? Probably not. I mean, that's why divorces exist. But you know what? That's fine because you shouldn't really give your love unconditionally to something unless it's immensely cherished like a child. 
I am never going to unconditionally love a partner. The only time I'm ever going to love a partner is if they fulfill certain conditions, like, you know, they are nice to me, and I like to be around them, and they're a kind person, and, and they're, you know, a, a beautiful soul, and they, and they brighten my day, and it makes me happy to be around them. If that doesn't happen, I'm not going to be in that relationship. So don't, for those of you pining for a love that is uh, unrequited, I, I understand it's hard to let go of, but understand that there are conditions to love, and it's okay to have those conditions because we all deserve, and deserve is kind of a strong word if I'm going to use it here, we all deserve a good, happy relationship. There's too much negativity in the world to deal with a relationship that's bad. So those are your conditions. Lesson number 11. Niceness is a great smokescreen. There's something, uh, here's an analogy I like to, uh, well, not an analogy, a, a thingy. Here's a thingy I like to, uh, to, to say. In life, there is the sword at your front and the knife at your back. What I mean by this is, let's use an extreme example. Uh, out there, there is uh, white supremacists who hate me because I'm a brown man. But I don't really mind that because I understand that they hate me for irrational reasons, and they are the sword at my front. I can draw my blade and face them head on because I know it. However, the knife at my back is more insidious. It's the people who, who smile and say, I'm your friend. Oh, I'm just there to help you. Don't mind me as I undermine everything in your life and I stab you in the back. That is the knife at your back. And unfortunately, niceness, the, the fake smile, is a great smokescreen to hide that insidious nature. And that is something you're going to have to watch out for in life. Uh, that's just the unfortunate truth. Lesson number 12. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. This is kind of a piggyback off of the niceness is a great smokescreen to kind of say, don't be paranoid, like super paranoid. Um, I mean, if you're in a live or die situation, it's okay to be paranoid because the situation calls for it. But not everyone is out to get you. Not everyone who smiles and, and says, well, hello there, lovely day, isn't it? Not, not all of them are the knife at your back. Sometimes people are just nice. And it takes time and it takes open-mindedness to kind of accept that. Especially if you've been burnt a bunch of times. I understand if you have trust issues, but not everyone is out to get you. Sometimes it is what it is and there's no double meaning and hunting for it is just going to make you miserable. Lesson number 13, do not underestimate the power of superstition. 13 is an unlucky number because people believe it to be so. In Japan, 4 is an unlucky number because the word 4 also means death, and people think it's bad. That's just life. Um, if you think about, like, zealous religion or flat earthers, uh, people who believe in, in these ideas, it's because they elicit an emotional response, and emotions are very strong. So... Be aware of that. People will fight to the death for these ideas. They have since humanity began. So, you know, keep your head on a swivel for those kind of things, because that's the, that's the truth of life. Lesson number 14. Don't underestimate the power of logic. The people do have the ability to reason. Even the craziest zealots do have a bit of logic in their mind somehow. Even flat earthers can say, well, I need to drink water because, you know, I'm thirsty and, and I'm a human being and, and human beings need water. So there is logic in there. And unfortunately, people can't be logicked out of ideas that they weren't logicked into. But if you can come to them with a friendly demeanor and ease their emotions, you can plant the seeds of logic. You can say, hey, friend, let's have a beer. Let's have a chat. What do you think about? Oh, flat earth. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, what if, uh, you know, w what if there was a curvature? What would you say to that? And then you kind of ease the logic in and, and say, like, you know, you don't beat them over the head. People don't like that because you elicit their emotions. So logic is difficult, but it can be achieved and it can be very powerful. Lesson number 15. Everyone has a dark side. Viciousness, evilness, whatever you want to call it, it's in all of us. It's not just in bad people and evil serial killers and, and, and dictators and all that stuff. We all have it. The idea is how much does it consume you? And are you afraid of it? Do you let it control you? And it's something that you shouldn't be afraid of or abhor. You have to accept it because it's a part of you. You have to learn how to control it and understand it and be with it. Because if you don't... It will consume you. 
There will be a winner in this fight. Make sure that it's you. Lesson number 16. Having fear and overcoming it is superior to having no fear at all. Those who know no fear are those who know no struggle. And they are weak. There will come a day, no matter who you are, where you will face the struggle, you will feel the fear. And if you have been fearless your whole life and suddenly it comes, it will blindside you, cripple you. It will make you helpless. It will make you feeble. Knowing your fear, being with it, understanding it, facing it, that's what makes you strong. Because when the struggle comes, you will know what to do. Knowing fear is knowing struggle. Conquering fear is conquering struggle. And conquering struggle makes you strong. Lesson number 17. Embrace the cringe and it will no longer be cringe. My definition of cringe is the ineffective unfamiliar. What do I mean by that? Everyone knows how to walk because walking is a great way to move forward. So nobody looks at someone walking with that strange gait, throwing their legs out in front of another and going, ooh, that's cringy. Why is he doing that? Ooh, uh, uh. If walking made you fall on your face the whole time because it was, an, it was an ineffective way of locomotion, then you would cringe. Think of someone like wallowing in the ground and like flailing their arms trying to walk forward and you would probably cringe because it's weird. People don't move that way and it's ineffective. However, if someone started doing that and like were winning sprinting competitions, then all of the you know sports scientists would be dis would be studying the the arm flailing method, and you'd see Usain Bolt break the speed record, you know, doing, doing the weird crawl, and all of a sudden, it's not cringy anymore because it works. It's unfamiliar, but it's effective, and because it's effective, it will become familiar. What I'm trying to say is. That thing that's cringy, that, that sonic fandom, that, that OC artwork, whatever, make it effective, make it good, make it yours, make it entertaining, and it will no longer be cringy because it will be good. It'll be effective. And once it's effective, people are willing to accept it as the familiar, and it will no longer be cringe. Lesson number 18. An open mind is a great gauge for maturity. Maturity is not age, but a lot of you have probably figured that out by now. Maturity, I believe, is the open mind. It's the ability to take in an idea, think about it, and not be governed by it, not be enslaved by it. I find it strange how there's a lot of people out there who say, don't engage with, with those people, even people with legitimately bad ideas. They say, don't engage with them because that means you're a part of them, as if they're afraid that you're going to be brainwashed into their lunacy. But you're not going to be brainwashed into their lunacy if you're open-minded and mature because you can see, oh, I see, you, you hate black people. Um, you, you, you think that uh, this, this group of people are, are bad and deserve, and deserve horrible things to happen to them. Why do you believe that? And so you're open to it. it. It's the idea of having that open conversation. It goes back to the don't underestimate the power of logic. You know, so you can engage with it and not be consumed by it because you're not a fool. But those with the closed mind who think they have an open mind are afraid of people engaging with, with the bad because they think they will be consumed by it because they're so weak-minded. But being open-minded means you have a strong mind because you can handle it. And that, I believe, is the true gauge of maturity. Lesson 19. Having fun is more fun than being serious. Dude, life is short, man. Just have fun with it. Obviously, there's a time to be serious. There's a time to buckle down and get things done. But after that, have fun with stuff. You guys might be familiar with the concept of the four-hour work week, which is a book some guy wrote that I'm too lazy to look up right now. But uh, the, the concept is that there's really only four hours in the day where you are truly effective. So in an eight-hour work day, only four of those hours are spent truly being at work, and the rest you just kind of goof off, look up funny videos on YouTube and stuff. So the idea is that be serious for those four hours. Buckle down, no distractions, get all your work done. And then you have the rest of the 20 hours, well, I guess you're sleeping for a chunk of that. You have the rest of the waking day to have fun, you know, kick back, laugh at cartoons or clowns or whatever you want to you do, you know? Be effective, but have fun for the rest of the time. Lesson number 20, progress is not linear. This goes not only for general success, but also for recovery. There's going to be periods where you think you're doing well, and then all of a sudden you backslide. And the backslide can be terrifying. Uh, especially if it's if it's like recovery involving, especially if it's like a, a physical ailment or maybe an, a mental illness where you're backsliding, it can be very discouraging and, you know, you feel like there's no way out of this 
hole that you're digging yourself into or you're being dug into. But understand that that is part of the process. It's not uh, you're not going to be in a in a in a rocky montage when you're going through this. You're going to have your downs, but if you keep working at it, you're also going to have an up. And eventually, with perseverance and the right treatment or the right battle plan, you will prevail. Just accept that there's going to be times where you trip up. Just get up. Fall down nine times, get up ten. Lesson 21. People change for better or for worse. There's probably a lot of you who have had childhood friends who drift apart. Maybe you had a best friend and you guys had a falling out because of a petty disagreement or, or a big disagreement or something. And you realize this person is not who I thought they were. A big one is in relationships. When, 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 you, see, when you see one side of the person but they change or maybe you see their true colors or something or maybe you just fall out of love. It happens and it hurts, especially if it's a close relationship. But it's something you have to accept that happens because you have changed. If you're a person, you have changed somehow in some way. If you haven't changed, you're honestly doing something wrong. But it's just the way of life and sometimes it hurts and it's okay if it hurts because there's really no way to control other people. Lesson 22, come to your own conclusions. It's a very good idea to get a lot of information from a lot of different sources, but eventually you're going to have to make the decision for what you believe in. It's smart to think of both sides, but eventually you're going to have to pick a side or you're going to have to take the good and the bad of the sides and come to your own ideas. It's safer to glomp onto a bigger collective. I know it is. It's, it's nice to have a tribe. It's nice to have people who, who agree on one idea and be in that comfort zone. But if you truly want to think for yourself, you're going to have to even criticize your own if you disagree with them. The idea is that are they able to take that in stride and understand that's what you're doing and not, you know, attacking them. So thinking for yourself is difficult. I understand it's difficult. It's difficult for me. Sometimes I just want to, you know, stay on a side and, and be safe, but I can't live a life like that. And I, it feels more rewarding when I do come to my own conclusions. Lesson 23. There's a difference between childlike and childish. This is kind of a piggyback off of the uh, have fun with life idea where, you know, be effective for those four hours and have fun the rest of the time. Childlike is reconnecting that part of your childhood where the world was was a wonder. You asked a funny question. Why do we have toes? Why is the sky blue? Can a fish fly? Uh, what if an can what if an elephant flapped its ears re really fast? Could, could an elephant fly? What if you what if you took an elephant and, and 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 taught it how to swim? Could it could it grow fins? You know, think of all the wild things you were thinking of when you were a kid. All the imagination that you had. Your your imaginary friend who was a hundred feet tall and could, you know, make clouds turn into cotton candy. That's freedom and curiosity and imagination. That is childlike nature. Childishness, <laughs> childishness is the bad part. It's the negativity of being a child. It's being stubborn, stomping your feet, going, no, no, I want it my way. Uh, I know everything because I'm a kid, and, and candy is good, and we should have candy all the time, and no more bads, and no more school, and, and, and stay up all night. You know, it's, it's your stubbornness. It's, think, it's, it's ironically the closed part. It's no longer being imaginative. It, it's saying this is final, and I'm done, and I refuse to budge. I refuse to listen. So embrace childlikeness. <laughs> And uh, try to stay away from childishness. Lesson number 24, everyone should learn how to fight. This kind of goes with lesson 1 and 15, the idea of being autonomous and understanding that the world doesn't owe you anything. There's this idea I've heard people talk about, and I agree with it. It's the concept that there are people who think they're good people because they don't engage in violence because they can't. You're not a good person. You're a weak person. If push came to shove and you had to defend yourself and you couldn't, that is not a choice. And goodness, like evil, is a choice. Those who have the ability to fight back, those who are tough, who hone their bodies, who understand the nastiness of the world, but choose to fight for good, to uphold justice, that is true goodness, which is why I believe everyone should learn how to properly defend themselves and how to properly kick someone's ass if necessary.
we uphold superheroes because they're super, they're super strong, and they fight for good. How easy is it for the likes of Superman to take over the world? I mean, there's so many comics about what if Superman were evil? Oh, what if Superman were evil? Well, it would be scary, but he's good. He's strong, and he can fight, and, you know, <laughs> he can really wreck someone's day, but he doesn't. He, he stands for truth and justice, and we admire those aspects. So I believe everyone should learn how to fight. Plus, it's, it's a good exercise, man. You know, stay in shape. Keep yourself healthy. You'll live long and, and prosper, right? So, yeah. Go, uh, go find a boxing gym. It's, it's fun. Lesson number 25. The world is full of necessary evil. This ties into the previous lesson of learning how to fight and the lesson talking about uh, the concept of evil. I say necessary evil because earlier in the video I was giving the example of having to kill an old lady for the sake of saving the world, and that's a horrifying thing. We, ha we have war for an unfortunate reason. Now, there's a lot wrong with war nowadays with the military-industrial complex and a whole bunch of other political nonsense I'm not going to get into. But there are bad people out there who are willing to harm, which is why you need to learn how to fight which is why it's a good thing we have the ability to defend ourselves with our troops out there. And we don't want to cause harm. War is hell. It's horrible. You know, it's, it tears people up. But because, because people are willing to tear people up, we have to be ready to stop it. And it's okay to dream about, you know, peace on earth and kumbaya and everything. And... I don't like to disparage it too much because it, it, it's a nice thing to have, but understand that in our lifetimes that will not be achieved, unfortunately. Lesson 26. Struggle is relative. I don't like whinging. I honestly don't. When people complain about stupid nonsense when there's worse things in the world, it does irritate me. However, I do understand that there are some real struggles that you can have even living in the privileged first world. It's not fair to downplay someone's struggle just because someone else is worse. You know, like, oh, my, my, my dog died. Your dog died? My dog and my cat died. Oh, yeah? Well, my dog died and my cat died and my mom died. Oh, yeah? Well, one up and I have cancer. And I have cancer and I have no arms and no legs. And, 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 and. It can always get worse. It can always get worse. Of course it can. But... If someone is truly hurting, even if it's something small, let them have that moment where they're in pain and, and offer some help if you can. You know, it's one thing if someone is just whining like, oh, my coffee. You didn't put enough creamer in my coffee. I'm calling the manager. I mean, that's whinging. But like, you know, if you're having a frustrating day and, and, and you see someone and they spill their coffee and they just break down in tears, you know, and, and you make fun of them for crying over spilled coffee. It was like, well, is it the spilled coffee? Maybe it, maybe they're having a struggle in their life. You know, it doesn't matter that they have the privilege of being able to go out to Starbucks and have the money to buy a coffee, you know, and it's just like, well, some people don't have that. Yeah, but, like, you don't know what that person's going through. So struggle is relative. Understand that and, and try to be helpful. Come on. Lesson 27. Empathy is harder than sympathy. The idea of sympathy is that you can relate to what someone is going through. I can sympathize with someone who, you know, went through, and this is kind of a deep one, child abuse, because I went through child abuse. Empathy is different, because there are some people who have suffered things that I can never understand. I have the great privilege of not having mental illness. I don't have to worry about anxiety. I don't have to worry about depression. These things do not affect me. I have many friends who are hounded by these mental illnesses, some of them cripplingly so. I, I don't know what it's like to, to feel that emptiness where nothing makes you happy. That is alien to me. But it is my moral obligation, I guess, to empathize with these people and say, like, I, I understand at the very least that having such a horrible thing hound you must be terrible. What can I do to help? Is there, is there anything I can offer you? Can I be there for you? Can I, would you like some cookies? Something. It's incredibly hard. And unfortunately, I found that a lot of people think that they're good people when all they really do is sympathize. And they can't understand. It's that othering. I don't like it when people other. Because they think that their side is the one with the nuance and the suffering. And the other side, they're just evil. That's a lack of empathy. 
like fundamentally that's a lack of empathy but empathy is very difficult i understand that it's hard for me it really is but you know i try to do my best lesson 28 conviction is important now i'm kind of circling back because 30 lessons is a kind of a lot of lessons so some of these kind of repeat but it's the concept of come to your own conclusions and it's good to have an open mind but eventually you're going to have to make a choice when you do when you truly feel that you stand for something stand for it do not bend do not bow because some of your opinions are going to hurt some fifis and there's a difference between legitimately causing emotional pain to someone and hurting their fifis when you when you cause emotional pain to someone you've hurt them on in a personal level and that's something you need to talk through. However, if you rustle their jimmies because you believe one way and they believe another, get over it, man. There's bigger problems in this world. And you need to ha know where you stand and be around people who also have strong convictions. And guess what? If you both have strong convictions that are disagreeable, but you're both mature, you can talk about it. I have very close friends who have opinions I think are wackadoodle. But it's not enough to, to uh, you know, rustle my jimmies and, and go, you know, harumph, I say. And they're the same way. And I appreciate that about them. We can actually sit down and talk about this stuff. And I love it because they have strong principles. And that is something I strive to have, is these strong, strong principles that I can defend with conviction. Lesson 29. Relationships are the greatest joy in life. People make the world go round. Everything in your life ultimately revolves around people. The greatest memories you will have is time spent with friends and family. The when you are on your deathbed, you're going to be want to you're you're going to want to be surrounded by people. I mean, there's some people who are misanthropes, but they're few and far between. Think about a lot of the times when you hear people when they're diagnosed with a terminal illness, the first thing that comes to mind is is they say that everything drops away. And they appreciate the little things in life all of a sudden. And a lot of the little things involves like spending time with their kids or their significant other or, or their parents or whatever. And they realize that relationships are a joy. And I cherish my relationships more than anything else in life, except maybe my health, because if my health goes and everything else just kind of doesn't matter, <laughs> you know. But like, even with deteriorating health, I would still... I just don't want my final days to be with people and with those relationships. And if you have good relationships, hold on to them because they're going to be what matters at the end of your time on this planet. Lesson 30. Everything ends, and that's okay. During this decade, the 2010s, 2010 to 2020, a lot of happened in, a lot happened in my life in my 20s. Uh, among those things were the death of two people who were close to me. And when people die, when they when they leave, they, they yeet this mortal coil, it's the end. You know, you never get to see them again in this life, if there even is another life out there. And the unfortunate truth, or maybe fortunate, the, the, the truth is that death comes for us all. Everything will end. This YouTube channel will end one day. I will no longer make videos for one reason or another. YouTube will end for one reason or another. The internet will end for one reason or another. But that is life. You know, it's that it's that matrix quote. Everything that has a beginning has an end. And we have to accept that no matter how sad or scared it, it, it makes us. I was watching a couple of... Uh, like TED talk videos about the concept of people going through near death experiences. And, uh, they all kind of describe the same thing of like drifting out of their bodies and going through a long tunnel. And, and at the end of the tunnel is like this, this, this warm lights and visions of their relatives. And it seems very peaceful. And there was a really interesting study where of all the people, everyone that they studied who had these near death exper experiences, like thousands of them, they all said that they basically did not fear death anymore because they went through that experience. What is that? Well, you know, some people say that it's it's the proof of the afterlife. Some people say, no, it's the DMT in your brain that's released when you die and then you go on an acid trip. <laughs> you basically go on a, a self-induced acid trip. But that's almost kind of comforting because it seems like if you die, two th one of two things happen. Either... 
one, there is an afterlife and it's eternal bliss and that's awesome. Or two, it's an acid trip and you die and you're done forever. The end. No more. Which is kind of a bummer. But that's a big bummer, honestly. Uh, if I'm going to be truthfully honest, that would really suck. But even if it is the truth, we can rest assured, I guess, that we're not going to care. Because in those final moments, we're going to be so doped up on DMT that we're going to think that we're going to heaven for eternity in our final moments. And I guess that's comforting because you're not going to be around to see the lie that your brain told you. You're going to be dead. That's it. That's the end. You, you don't have to think or feel anymore. And you don't have to, you don't have to uh, be afraid for all eternity. They're like, oh, I can't feel. Oh, I'm suffering for all eternity because there's nothing. You're too, you're, you're not there to feel anymore. You know, the last thing you're going to feel in life is ascending to heaven for all eternity and, and, and your and your loved ones are there and it's going to be happy. And in a weird way, that's kind of comforting to know that even if it's a lie, you're going to be too dead to notice. So yeah, those are my 30 lessons at 30. Um, I guess this is the end of the video. I'll do the usual shill. Here are, my, here are the buttons. Press the buttons. Uh, this, if this is your first video with me, that's not what I usually do. I like to draw cartoons. But if this attracts you, then hit that subscribe button. I'd love to, you know, have you stick around. Also, leave comments. I really want I want to engage with this because I want to know what you guys think of my lessons. If some of you are 30 or older, if you have lessons of your own, or even if you're younger and there's things you've learned or agree with or disagree with me on, definitely let me know. I want to hear it. Also, uh, as per usual, I'm going to link to my intro video in the description box down below. And the reason why I do that is because it has all of my... Uh, social media links that you can go to if you want to stalk me on the interbuts. I'll go ahead and put them up on the screen so you can read them off here if you want to type them in manually like a weirdo. But with all that said, um, I thank you for spending this time with me in these final uh, twilight days of my 20s. And I look forward to seeing you in my 30s because, yeah, I'm getting older, but you know what? Uh, I'm excited. Let's see what Let's see what the 30s <laughs> yield, shall we? So yeah. Until next time, guys, deuces.